Luke is a child, but this is where God has got us this morning. Uh, we've been going through Luke's gospel, and I trust the sovereignty of God that this is where he wants us to be. You know, his word is enough, isn't it? And we trust that by his spirit he'll teach us this morning. Um, but I just want to do an extra little pray for us again, and then we'll, we'll begin. We do so need you, Lord. And it's nice even to have some quiet this morning. Jesus, you, um, at times when the disciples were flat out, you said, come aside and rest a while. And Lord, some of us need that. Some of us need um, the opposite, Lord, and we need stirring up. Some of us are in the middle. But we all need to see you, Jesus. We all need to receive from you. And I pray that you would do that this morning. Lord, please teach me as I teach. Um, speak the words that you want to speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Fab. Well, um, G and I uh, were given over a year ago one of those buy a gift vouchers to, um, to have an experience. And the experience that we were bought was a night glamping. So if you're familiar with glamping, the idea is it's camping, but you get some mod cons. Some glamping is more glam than others. So G took her cousins for their 18th and 21st birthday to this really nice glamping place. Um, There was a hot tub there. There was a wood-burning stove there. There were several beds inside this massive tent, and it was fantastic. Now, we have booked our two nights glamping, Um, The options weren't quite as glamorous as what G had. (laughs) But we're going to go in the start of March um, to Monmouthshire. In the backside of nowhere, there's no phone signal. There's a compost toilet. And um, there is a bed (laughs) inside a wooden hut. So we are going glamping. But I had the choice as I booked. Do I want to go in the, the glamping pod or the shepherd's hut? Now, the lady gave me a rundown of what these two things were. And I, I chose a glamping pod because it's got an electric fire. And I thought, you know, we'll have a little bit of glam. I'll take an electric fire. I don't want to be faffing around trying to stoke up the coals in the middle of the night and freezing Monmouthshire with a pregnant wife. So <laughs> we'll, go for, we'll go for an electric fire and our glamping. And um, I was just thinking about that electric fire. Maybe you've got one at home. You can have it, there's, there's a setting where you can put them where it's just light and, you know, it makes pretty flames, but it doesn't put out any warmth. And then there's a setting where you can have both. And there's a setting where it can just be warm without any light. And I thought, that's a picture really of two kinds of Christians. There are those of us who are a bit like on one setting of the electric fire, we're all light and no warmth. And there are those of us who are all warmth and coziness, but no light. Let me just explain that a little bit more. Those of us who are all light, but no warmth, perhaps know a lot of stuff. We've perhaps been enlightened. We can tell you all kinds of things. But there's not much love and practice there, not much warmth. And on the flip side, there are those of us who are very warm, very active. We do, there's a lot of good stuff that's done, but don't really know the God that we're serving. And the passage that Jean has read for us this morning, I think, speaks to uh, us whether we find ourselves in either of those categories. There are some of us that don't need to just discuss what we need to do. Don't just discuss, but do. And a man um, came to Jesus in verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. He was a lawyer, and he stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is an important question, isn't it? Um, just last night, thank you for those that have been praying for myself. Um, I've been at Keel Christian Union this week, and last night was a question and answer session. So if anybody, you know, be they atheist, agnostic, from another religion, Christian, they can pitch any questions to a panel of Christians at the front, of which I was one. 
And, you know, there were some really good questions asked, some very important questions asked. But this is right at the top. What shall we do to inherit eternal life? We're all going to die. We all must know that we're going to have life. Sometimes as Christians, we, when we share the gospel, we say, you know, um, though God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have eternal life. And we only make it something in the future. We only make it heaven or the new creation. But turn to John chapter 17 and verse 3, please. John chapter 17 and verse 3. Um, That's a very good question. If somebody's got the page, shout it out for us. John 17, verse 3. And these are the words of Jesus. And he explains what this idea of eternal life means. In John 17, verse 3, he says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Eternal life is knowing God. Do you know God? Obviously, you don't just know God in days to come. You can know him now when eternal life begins now. It's not just about a length of time, eternal, but it's a quality. The life of God. And so this man's asking What shall I do to inherit eternal life? He comes with an important question. But as Jean read that for us, what was the man's motive? Just have a look quietly for yourself from verses 25 to 29 and see whether you can see what the man's motive in asking this important question was. Well, in verse 25, it said that he stood up and in order to put Jesus to the test, he asked an important question, but with a bad motive, didn't he? He tried to put Jesus to the test. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a discussion with somebody and the question that they're asking, you know they don't really want an answer, do they? They want to make you look stupid. They want to prove that they know more than you. So they'll ask you some ridiculous question that you know, yeah, it doesn't matter. And this man asked Jesus this big important question to put him to the test. Christian, when you ask, say, a big theological question, are you asking in order to grow and to know, or are you asking in order to show off how much you know? People who ask in this way are never really going to get anywhere. They're only going to inflate their heads instead of inflaming their hearts and growing in knowledge of the truth. So also, what I want us to think, maybe you've been in that position where um, somebody who is not a Christian has asked you a question about your faith. And you have the opportunity there to kind of discern why is that person asking that question? Is it a red herring or is it a real hindrance to their coming to faith? And notice the way that Jesus replied. Jesus replied to a question, how? In verse 26, with another question. And that can be helpful sometimes. You know, you're engaging in a discussion. Somebody says, how many angels can fit on the head of a pin? Can God make a rock big enough that he himself can't lift it? And you can be like, either, hmm, I don't know. Or you can say, why? Does it bother you? (laughs) And you can discern then why a person's asking. And oftentimes, you can have a far more constructive conversation. But this man had an important question, but came with a bad motive. He came to test Jesus and to show off. And then in verse 29, um, he's he's already um, answered Jesus' question to him. Um, in fact, let me, let me just go back there. Jesus asked him that question. Well, how do you inherit eternal life? What does the law say? This man was an expert in the Bible. You tell me, Jesus says. And so the man said, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength 
and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. How many commands were given in the Bible? You can shout it out. You, you perhaps, there's, there's 10 commandments, but there's the, the Jewish scholars kind of picked out lots of different commandments overall that were given, lots of different instructions, and they identified 613 different instructions that God had given. But this man, Jesus doesn't say, oh no, you're wrong. What did Jesus say to his reply? He said, you've answered correctly. If you're confused about what to do, you know, you've got all these instructions that God gives you, well, part of this man's answer is right. If you were to boil it down, following God, loving him, obeying him boils down to loving God and loving people. But the man, you know, he wasn't happy with that. Because in verse 29, he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? He says, I know that the law says I need to love my neighbor, but who is my neighbor? Well, that's the plain answer, isn't it? The guy next door. Now, this man was a a lawyer, a Jewish lawyer. His next door neighbor was probably a respectable Jewish family. But what Jesus goes on to say expands what this man might think. But think, why did he ask that question? He wanted to justify himself. He wanted to satisfy himself that I just want Jesus to come and pat me on the back and say, yeah, you're you're doing everything fine. I wonder if when you perhaps ask questions of God... Maybe you say, search me, O Lord, and try me, know my heart, see if there's any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. Do we pray that in order to actually let God search our heart? Or do we pray that to tick a box and say, I've asked God to search my heart. (laughs) This man was asking to justify himself. Now, the answer that Jesus gives is curious. Firstly, he'd answered the man's question with a question. But what does he do here? He goes on to answer a man's question, who is my neighbor, with a story. We're all familiar with the story. We've heard it a thousand times. But Jesus, well, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. What was the man's initial question? Shout it out for us. Who is my neighbor? Uh, his question before that. Yeah, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Some of us read Jesus' answer and puzzled over that. The man asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? How can I be right with God? How can I be saved? And Jesus seems to say, keep the law. He says, do this and live. My question to you is, Do you need to do anything to inherit? The man says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You've probably had an inheritance at some point when a relative has died and they've passed on some of their estate to you. Did you need to do anything? Well, some of you had to be roped in with all the legalities, but practically speaking, you don't really need to do anything. Somebody else needs to name you in their will. And secondly, that person needs to die. And that's how you inherit, isn't it? So if we want to know eternal life, if we want to know God, it's not about us doing and keeping standards. It's, are we named on Jesus' will and has Jesus died? The only thing that we need to do, and I'll say that with a lowercase d, is we need to just accept that. That's the way that we receive eternal life. You don't need to do to inherit. You're named on the will, and that person must die. And Hebrews chapter 9 talks about that. You can look at that in your own time. The man asks a question to justify himself, but the way that he could be justified, made right with God, is just through Jesus and faith in him. But we move on then to the man's second question that Jesus answered with a story. 
And we'll read now from verse 30. The man asked, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Where was Jerusalem? It was the capital, wasn't it? Up on a hill. Where was Jericho? It was down in the valley. So he was going down this road and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. This road was notorious. You might think, well, that man was foolish. He traveled on his own. Why would you travel on the road? It was a road that was dangerous on your own. You know, some of us don't like to go out at night on our own. Well, this man did the equivalent and he got beat up. But verse 31, by chance, a priest was going down that road. So the priest, what does he do? He works in the temple, doesn't he? He offers sacrifices in Jerusalem. And I imagine he's had a couple of weeks busily serving God. He's, you know, been sacrificing animals. He's been praying with people. He's been following all sorts of commandments and doing things by the book as to God. And he's tired, maybe. And he's coming down after finishing his shift at the temple. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so likewise, a Levite. Who were the Levites? They were people in the tribe of Levi, weren't they? <laughs> Clues in the name. And they had religious responsibility as well. They were the people who looked after the temple service. Some of them sang songs in the temple and played instruments in the temple. You might say it's like the pastor walks down the road and the worship leader walks down the road. And when the Levite came to the place and saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Can you blame them? They could probably justify what they did, couldn't they? Like we all do when we see people in need. We think, Lord, I've seen that person in need, but I'll pretend that I haven't seen them and I'll carry on my merry way. Or, Lord, I've seen that person in need, but I'm feeling so tired. I've been working up at the temple for you. I've done my, you know, I've done my week serving you. I've done this thing for you, so I'm just going to carry on and walk past that person. Lord, I see that person, but it will put me in danger to help them. Lord, I see that person, but, you know, I've got places to go. You know, my wife's at home, she's preparing tea, and I can't delay helping this stranger on the road. We can all be like these people. But verse 33 says, But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal, and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, which is two days' wages, and he gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now Jesus wraps up his story and gives the conclusion, the punchline to the man, which of these three, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the the, the lawyer, the religious leader, said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. The man asked a question, who is my neighbor? But Jesus almost flipped the question on, on its head and said, it's not who is my neighbor, but who are you going to be a neighbor to? It doesn't matter whether that's somebody of a different nationality to the Samaritan, this Jewish guy in trouble was. It doesn't matter if that person is not someone that you'd normally associate with. Jesus says, who are you going to be a neighbor to? Now, I thought it was interesting that in verse 32, it says a Levite, um, 
Oh, not verse 32, verse 31. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And it's like that, isn't it? By chance, Lucy, you meet somebody, sorry to call you out, but I have. Um, (laughs) You, by chance, just meet that person at school and they're really struggling. Maybe you never really speak to them, but something they say makes you realize, actually, they're having a really rough time. Or Beth, by chance, when you're at the shops, Um, You know, you see that person you haven't seen for ages, but you know they're struggling in this way. It happens that way, doesn't it? By chance. We are to be a neighbor to those who are just come in front of us. Sometimes we take this story and we think, well, therefore, we've got to um, support a charity. That's, That's a good application. Or therefore, you know, I can't be like this Samaritan and and take this, you know, do this great thing, so I won't bother doing anything. We are to be a neighbor to those people who God puts in front of us. You might not meet somebody who's been beat up and left half dead and stripped naked and had everything stolen from them. You might. (laughs) But you might meet somebody who's struggling mentally. You might come across somebody whose family is in difficulty. You might come across somebody who is struggling financially. And, you know, they're really, next month's bills are really looming over them. You might come across somebody who's brokenhearted by chance. But I don't really believe there's any such thing as chance, especially not in the life of a Christian. When God puts those people in front of you, then Jesus will say, are you going to be a neighbor to this person? Jesus said to the man, who answered the question rightly, he said, go and do likewise. Let us not just, let me on Sunday morning, not just talk in general terms, make a nice sermon, and then drive home and ignore that person who I see. Or when that phone rings and I know that person's going to say, I'm in need, hit the red button and put it down. (laughs) You know, we've got to be practical about these things. And let me ask you a question. This man presumably thought he'd already, he was doing okay loving the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, but he perhaps just needed a little bit of instruction to love his neighbor. Can we love the Lord our God in that way and not love our neighbor? The answer is no. They go together. They complement. They're one and the same. So may we love those who God puts in front of us in a practical way. Go and do likewise. So we should not just discuss, talk about these things, talk about theological things and try and prove a point, but do. The Christian faith is practical. And secondly, um, don't just work, worship. Don't just discuss, but do. Don't just work, but worship. And we come to verse 38. Jean read it for us. And um, I'm going to read for us the passage again, verse 38 to 42. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. What a great thing that she did. Because she didn't just welcome Jesus, did she? Let's face it. She welcomed Jesus. She welcomed the 12 disciples. There may have been some other people there as well. It's like, you know, the doorbell rings. I don't know if you've ever seen um, The Lord of the Rings um, and the the first film where... um, I've got it all wrong. No, it's in The Hobbit. I think it's in The Hobbit where um, Bilbo has, you know, had this one dwarf come. But then he brings all of his friends and it's knock after knock after knock after knock after knock and he ends up entertaining these, you know, many, many, many dwarves in his house. Well, it was like that for Martha. But bless her, you know, she wasn't just going to say, uh, ER, um, I've got a voucher for Toby Carberry, go there. But she welcomed Jesus and his whole entourage into her house. What a good thing. She looked after the practical needs she, you know, she was somebody who saw a need and she went to meet it. She was cooking up a storm. She welcomed him into her house. She was doing a good thing in working. And she had a sister called Mary 
who sat at the Lord's feet. And interestingly, whenever you see Mary in the Bible, which is three times, this particular Mary, she's always at Jesus' feet. But she was sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Martha was doing something great. She was working hard for Jesus. It was good. But she had a problem. And the problem was, well, we're going to see it in verse 40. Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? She's been there, you know, she's got the casserole on the hob there. She's trying to prepare the rice. She's making a brew. She's warming up the plates and everything's going everywhere. She's dropped some things on the floor. She's pulling her hair out and there's Mary. She's just having a little Bible study, sat down at Jesus' feet. Ah, come on. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Don't you want your tea? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. And I think he wasn't telling her off. He was saying, Martha, come here. You're anxious and troubled about many things. And that can be the way, can't it? When you have many things, that can really get you anxious and troubled. The word for troubled um, comes from a word from which we get turbine. You know, your head is spinning around like a turbine. You're troubled by many things. You know, as people, we can't do many things well, can we? If you're a jack of all trades, what are you? You're a master of none. And I think it is better to do few things well than to do many things poorly, isn't it? Because Jesus says, you're troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Martha, if you're going to do only one thing in the day, if there's only one thing that you will never, never give up, what will it be? Well, let me tell you what it should be. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Martha's problem wasn't Mary. Martha's problem wasn't even necessarily the work that she was doing. It was good. Martha's problem was that she'd allowed her work to distract her from the most important thing. She'd taken her eyes off Jesus. And you know, we're in a small church. <laughs> of course you know. <laughs> we, we know that this morning, don't we? When we're in a small church, there's only a few of us that can do things. You know, we each have different gifts, don't we? And we should all use our gifts. But you might be one of those people who, bless you, thank you. You're on every single rotor that there is. But, you know, if you're serving God... Is me, or I'll actually put that in inverted commas. If your serving God is causing you to neglect your worship of Him, then knock off a rotor. I could do without a cup of tea if it meant that you were loving Jesus more. You know, I think some of us are weary, aren't we? You know, maybe you feel that. Some of you have expressed that over the past few months. You know, maybe we've done a lot in the church. It's better to do a few things well than to do many things and be anxious and troubled. And I want each of us to be those... It's not an either or, is it? It's not like you either work or you spend time with Jesus. It's both and. But I certainly want each of us to be those who spend time with Jesus. If I was to ask you what's the non-negotiable in your day, maybe it's your cup of coffee in the morning before things get mad. Or maybe it's watching Coronation Street, whatever time Coronation Street comes on. That's your blocked out time. I always do that. Well, really, it should be each day, let's just take some time to be with God. I'm going to be having a baby soon, and I'm going to find that very difficult, so I hear. But I've got to make sure that I do. You know, maybe that's going to be when he's just gone to sleep. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's like, yeah, at that point. Or when he's... Thank you. <laughs> I have had to read how to change a nappy. Yeah, 
I don't think it's going to go well. <laughs> but it is essential. One thing is necessary, and that's it. Devotion to Jesus. The most important part of the Christian life is the part that only God sees. A quote that stuck with me from a sermon I heard probably seven or eight years ago by a guy called John Corson, and he said this, if we take care of the depth of our devotional life, God will take care of the breadth of our ministry. I think that's so true. If we take care of the depth of our devotional life, our, our time with Jesus each day, God takes care of the rest. Let that be that one thing that is necessary. I've had a crazy week, but let me tell you that those days when I thought, Do you know, Lord, I could spend another hour preparing for this talk, or I could just spend some time singing to you and praying, those have been the days actually when I've been most effective in what I've done. And I always find that to be true, but I have to remind myself of that week by week. So we'll wrap up and conclude. How would you answer those questions that have come up in the passage? How would you answer the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, I hope you've learned that we don't have to do anything. If we want to know eternal life, which is life in Jesus now and into eternity, then we receive what he has done. We are named on his will and he has died for us. Accept that. And then once we've been shown such love, then we go about loving others. You know, the hero of every story is Jesus. Not necessarily the Samaritan. But you know, Samaritan points us to Jesus. He looked and he had compassion. Jesus looked on you with compassion. Jesus poured on oil and wine to soothe and to heal. And he does that to us when we are hurting today. Jesus went out of his way, even though he was rejected and despised, to take care of us. And he carries on doing, just like the man left money to look after the, the, the wounded man, Jesus will carry on what he is doing, and he'll carry on the work in us. The other question I'd ask you, who is my neighbor? How would you answer that? Well, I hope that we've seen that it's not necessarily who is my neighbor, but who am I going to be a neighbor to? By chance, somebody might come up in front of you in need. Show yourself a neighbor to them. Be practical. Put some money in an envelope. Give somebody an encouraging phone call. Uh, give them a lift to hospital. Give them advice, perhaps, where they're struggling or help to find a job, whatever it might be. Be a neighbor to those who God puts in front of you. And lastly, is it better to work like Martha or to worship? Yes. <laughs> it's best to do both that's what we should aim for what we do with Christ though is far more important than what we do for Christ so God let us be not just um, a fire with all light and no warmth and not just a fire with warmth and no light but those who know and we experience him growing in our knowledge but we're also putting that into practice and we're loving and we are serving our neighbor and those around us. So that's, that's our message for this morning. May God help us in it. Amen.